Welcome back. All right, so I think we can all agree that one of the reasons we love watching hockey, National Hockey League games, is the creativity, the fun, the offense, those beautiful goals, those end-to-end -end rushes where the guy dekes around the goalie and scores, and we all get to our feet, and we cheer. Coaches don't like it. Coaches generally don't enjoy those plays, and I mean the coach on the other team. Uh, coach on the other team, after seeing a guy go end-to-end -end like that's like, Where's the defense? What were they doing? What, how, how did that guy not get drilled into the boards? All right, and they might call a timeout and discuss it with their players and yell at them after. Coaches generally will try to keep the scoring down and the creative plays, like for instance, people worry about the Michigan. I've seen people say, oh, the Michigan shouldn't, it, it doesn't feel like it should be an NHL goal. Don't worry about it. Coaches, goaltenders, defensemen will figure it out and the Michigan will be basically defended and nullified at some point. Uh, and so when I, when we look at this, I feel like you got to look back. So I look back to 91-92. 91-92, you're getting into uh, a different era than the 80s. So the 80s was basically scoring, scoring, scoring. It did continue into the early 90s, but it would change. And there's a reason why I'm doing this video today. There's just, there's a trend that we've started to see in hockey a little bit, just a little, and it, it's very, very small. It might just be a blip but it's been a blip before. So 91-92, the average goal scored by a team is 3.48. Uh, Brett Hull, 70 goals that season. Uh, he had an 86 goal season uh, before that too. And Mario Lemieux had 131 points. Mario Lemieux, excellent player throughout his career. 92-93, uh, the goal scoring goes up. 3.63 goals scored per game per team. Uh, McGillney and LaFontaine both had 76 goals that season. It was absolutely magical season for goal scoring and Mario Lemieux had 160 points. So we saw a lot of scoring, a ton of scoring. In 93-94 drops by about half a goal, down to 3.24 goals per game, per team. Uh, Pavel Bure for the for the Vancouver Canucks, uh, 60 goals for Bure that year. Uh, Gretzky had 130 points, so your league leaders, again, Bure 60 goals, absolutely remarkable. And Bure, uh, his scoring stayed high even when the scoring dropped around the league. 94-95, uh, a lockout shortened season. 2.99 goals scored per game per team, which is the lowest it had been in quite some time. Uh, Bondra had 34 goals over a 48-game schedule. Uh, Yager and Lindros tied am uh, amongst the league leaders for points with 70 points each. Again, a 48-game season. 95-96, the scoring goes up to 3.14 goals per game. Uh, Mario Lemieux had 69 goals that season, and he had 161 points. And when we talk about some of the scoring marks we've seen over the last few years, 95-96 is kind of that year where they say it's the highest since 95-96. Sometimes they'll say since 92-93. Those two years, we saw some remarkable goal scoring and point runs. But 96-97, it drops off. So what started in 94-95, you get the New Jersey Devils winning the Stanley Cup, playing the neutral zone trap, and it starts to catch on a bit. But there's other reasons for that. So 96-97, the goal scoring drops to 2.92 goals on average per team in the NHL. Uh, Keith Kachuk's the leader in goals with 52. Mario Lemieux at 122 points. 97-98, goal scoring drops to 2.64 per game per team. Uh, Bondra and Solani tying amongst the league leaders in goals with 52. Uh, Yager, the league leader in points with 102. So scoring's dropped off quite a bit at that point. It drops again in 98-99, just a little bit, 2.63. Uh, Solani, 47 goals. Yager, 127 points. So there was no 50-goal scorer that year. Remember, that was a headline, that there was no 50-goal scorer. But it wouldn't be the last time we saw no 50-goal scorer in the NHL uh, before the lockout. 99-2000, Burray. Even though the goal scoring per game per team is 2.75, Burray gets 58 goals. Yeah, remarkable season for Burray. Uh, Yager, 96 points. So we didn't have a 100-point scorer that year. So we did have a 50-goal scorer, no 100-point getter. 2000-2001, uh, 2.76 goals per game. So the scoring's up a little bit. Uh, and it, it didn't stay at, at record lows, but it would come down again. Burry had 59 goals that year. Yager had 121 points. So if you look at scoring now, you look at what Burry was doing then. This is during the clutch and grab era. I think Burry could have hit 70 goals playing in today's game. 2001-2002, uh, 2.62 goals scored per game per team, which is the lowest on the board thus far. Again, led 52 goals and 96 points. He led the league in both. 2002-2003, uh, the goal scoring, 2.65 goals per game. So it stays about the same, really. 
97 or yeah 97 98 through 2002 2003 it's right around the same uh hey duke had 50 goals to lead the league uh peter forsberg 106 points to lead the league there uh 2003 2004 the last year before the lockout 2.57 goals scored per team per game again luck kovalchuk and nash tied at league lead for goals with 41 yeah we only had three 40 goal scorers that year uh, Marty San Louis led the league in 94 points. But the discussion point at that stage was about scoring and creativity and how it had kind of been squashed out of the game. Uh, so coming out of the lockout in 2005, they needed some rule changes in order to make the league more exciting. But how do we get to this point? Well, see, what happens in the 90s is the league ends up going from 21 teams to 30. And so you're 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 diluting the talent absolutely by adding nine teams that quickly you're setting up a scenario where a coach is still expected to get wins the talent he's putting out on the ice is not what it was there were still some very talented teams well how do you neutralize that talent you go out there and you make sure they can't get through the neutral zone you clog everything up you make sure that you've got five guys basically standing at the red line waiting for them remember there was no two-line pass so if you're in your own zone you could not pass past center uh, without it coming back as a two-line pass. So the NHL decides to change that, but what we had seen was that expansion, which initially leads to more goals, led to more defense, more cracking down on goal scoring by coaches. Like, they just didn't want the, the creativity because they couldn't compete. I always got confused when there were teams, though, that would play that style of hockey that I didn't feel like needed to. Like, I understood when an expansion team like Nashville or Atlanta or, in some cases, Ottawa, whoever, if they decide, hey, you know, we, we can't score three, four goals a night, so we need to clog the neutral zone and play everybody back and play defense, defense, defense. And and the trap was really about counterattack. But it was weird to me when a team that had the talent to win a full-on regular NHL game where there wasn't a trap being deployed would, would deploy that style. But some coaches prefer it. They just prefer to look at the sheet at the end of the night and say, look, we only had 20 shots against and only three of them were good shots. So great job, guys. Uh, we got two goals and they only got three chances to score on the net. It does lead to a, a drier viewing experience. Uh, as I've as I've mentioned, if, if the league does go in that direction again, it makes it a bit easier for me to track everything but it, it does lead to, to tougher hockey to watch. And the NHL understood this back in 2005. So an entire season's wiped out for a lockout. One way that the NHL saved itself coming out of that whole year, which didn't make the players or the owners look good. That whole lockout, that whole year, it was just ugly. And so when they came back, they knew they had to change things because they, they could not have the league come back and still be this defensive muck, basically. Uh, so first thing they did was... Uh, they brought in all these new rule changes. And it was easy to bring in rule changes after hockey's been gone for a year. I don't think the NHL could do this now. So if we do see scoring drop off, if we see teams picking up on, hey, this defensive style works, it is a copycat league and all, um, I, I don't think we would see like massive sweeping changes. I think minor tweaks could happen, but I, I don't know how you would do that. Basically a way to encourage offense and creative play, right? Um, that's and that's important. You want to sell your game. It should be exciting. It should be fast, and and there should be scoring chances. Um, and and I like a mix of good defense and good offense. I like a mix of both. Uh, so the goal lines got pushed back. What's interesting is they had just pushed the goal lines forward. The idea was, hey, you know, Gretzky does all of his work behind the net. What if we gave a team more room behind the net, more creativity, and more wraparounds? It actually had the opposite effect. It it shortened up the 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 uh, attacking zones it just didn't work and so uh they go back to what was the original uh setup for the zones uh they also introduced the shootout which i still don't like it's been all those years i still don't like the shootout i i would be fine with the shootout going away and it's interesting because it feels like there's a lot of gms that would be interested in not limiting or, or not eliminating but limiting the shootout and, you know, via either making overtime longer, which I don't know if the union would go for. I don't know if the NHL likes the idea of the OT being longer either. It would definitely solve part of that. Uh, but even the three-on-three the -three overtime, coaching has changed that. Now it's just, it's all about possession. So you might have an overtime where it's back and forth and each team has a chance. Or you might have an overtime where a team goes, well, we'll just hold on to the puck for five minutes. If we don't see a shot we like, I guess we're going to the shootout. And there's times where that happens. And I, I've never 
quite understood why you don't go for it and like next goal wins and you sit back it's an odd strategy so at any rate uh, the two line pass got introduced in part to get rid of the neutral zone trap teams couldn't line up at the red line now and just say hey they, they can't come across the red line now they could so they could pass around it they could get around the neutral zone trap um, and it's a setup that man if Burry had played in that era like take away the two line pass and some of the goal scorers from eras gone by would do quite well and I've seen that argument of, oh that they couldn't play in today's game yeah, the game was completely different back then. You take out the two-line pass uh, from today's game, and a lot of the the huge, great highlight reel goals you see wouldn't be there. The stretch pass is gone. So um, it is a completely different game than what it was in the 90s. So uh, they also brought back the tag up for offside. So you know how you can tag up? Yeah, you couldn't do that. It was just automatically whistled for offside. Uh, you're in the zone first. It's offside. You can't tag up and get it taken off the board. Uh, it, it definitely helped get rid of some of the stoppages. There were a lot of stoppages. Like I've seen people say, oh, they should just get rid of the puck over glass penalty. No. Uh, the amount of, of times you would see a defenseman just dump it over the glass, it's insane. And and it becomes a, 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 fe a feature, not a bug. So I, I'm okay with the delay game penalty, even though it can be frustrating. When you know the player doesn't mean to put it over the glass, but I remember a time where that was really common. And, oh, I don't have anywhere to put it. Right over the glass. Oh, whoops. So, yeah, they they, they had to bring that penalty in. Um, also, they brought in that line changes weren't allowed on icing calls. So, before that, you could. So, again, ice the puck and get a line change. Ice the puck and get a line change. And it means that the guys out on the ice are different than the ones that ice the puck. So, you have fresh skaters out there, and it gets a little bit ugly. That's the reason I'm wearing the ugly jersey today. So... Uh, the instigator also got changed. The instigator in a final five minutes can mean a suspension. And I remember this, and I say can mean because there's times where the NHL will rescind this, the uh, actual instigator penalty, so it's not a suspension, but it can mean a one-game suspension. I remember the the people who really liked the fighting in the game feeling like this was going to just, just kill the fighting in the game. But it, it did mean that, you know, final five minutes of the game, you're going to see a lot less of the, the fisticuffs but think about it. You take an instigator penalty in the five, final five minutes. Well, you got 17 minutes in penalties, but there's less than five minutes left, so who cares? Uh, so it, I understand why that's in place. It doesn't get called all that often. Uh, goalies, this is where the trapezoid gets brought in, so the goalies can't just come out and play the puck anywhere. I, I don't know how much that helps the flow of the game now. I, I don't know how often it helps. I've also seen recently, there's been a few times where I'm like, Pretty sure the puck went through through the area they're not supposed to play it there, so shouldn't that have been a penalty? Like, it, it feels like goalies can get really, really close, and as long as they're not blatantly playing it in that area, it doesn't get called. Uh, but I, I understand why that's there. That's your Marty Berder, Marty Turco. The Martys knew how to come out and play the puck, and it was with the idea of this should prevent goalies from being that third defenseman. What it also does, though, is it gets rid of plays where the goaltender just comes out and tries to be a puck handler and turns it over to the other team. Uh, it used to happen a lot more with that. But I, I get it. Um, the size of goalie equipment got reduced. I know that's something people still talk about, uh, size of goalie equipment, but it's nowhere near like it was. Uh, J.S. Shiger gets gets talked about a lot. He was called the Michelin Man for a reason. Uh, it was it was kind of crazy how big some of the, the, the shoulder pads and, and chest protectors, all that got. Because the idea is, of course, you're trying to protect the net. Well, if your equipment gets a lot bigger, so did you. And uh, it, it did get insane. And you don't see that now. So I, I do think that the size of goalie equipment being reduced and the crackdown on that, I think it worked. Uh, I've seen people talk about maybe make it smaller even still. I've seen people talk about increasing the size of the net. I'm really glad that never happened. Because at the time they originally talked about it, first off, Roberto Luongo came out right away and said, I'll just retire if they decide to do that. And I understood why he felt that way. Uh, because it, it completely changes the game. And the idea of increasing the size of the net by a couple inches, I, I don't know how many extra goals that's going to add, but I understand why a goaltender would be like, seriously? So I'm being punished for doing my job right? But the NHL understands too that goal scoring is a huge part of the appeal of the game to the fan. And it really is. So, And then there was the, the biggest thing that came out of 2005 was the crackdown on interference, hooking, and holding. And I don't know if this has come back into the game necessarily, but it does feel like I I, I feel like there's there's some that gets in there, 
But I, I don't think that's necessarily it. I think these players are just being coached really, really well, and, and some teams are playing that defensive style quite, quite well. And then the embellishment penalty got added. Um, the embellishment penalty is one that gets, gets kind of misused, I think, at times. For instance, if I trip a player and they decide to do a pirouette on their way down and a huge, oh my gosh, is it embellishment? Yeah, but the problem with that is that the embellishment is because I tripped him. So therefore, I don't understand the offsetting penalties because I did commit the foul. The embellishment to me, initially, I read as this is to try to get a call where there shouldn't be. And we definitely see that now. Uh, one of my favorites was, I believe it was Harry Neal that would talk about, he wouldn't say they dove. He would just say, and this play here, that's spectacular. He, he made sure he pointed his toes before he went in the water, which is, of course, a diving reference. I thought that was great. So I still say that. I still, if I see a player go down during the play, I'm like, wow, he really, he might get a 10 from the Russian judge on that one because he pointed his toes before he went in the water. So, it, and, and so it's there. I don't think the embellishment's as bad now as it was before that penalty came in. And we don't hear as much about it now as we did, say, five, ten years ago. So I feel like players are, are doing it a lot less. But expansion in the 90s got blamed for a lot of the the goal scoring dropping. And so we're, we're in an era right now where we've added Vegas and Seattle, which I don't think has added that much in terms of players in the league who are maybe a little less talented and maybe you need to, to coach more of the defensive side because you don't have the creativity you had before expansion. But in the event that the NHL does decide, hey, we're going to 36, we may see the scoring drop as a, as a response because there will be teams out there that may not have the creativity of others. And so the only way that you're going to compete with a team that's really creative and, and fast is to slow the game down and clog the middle of the ice and make it so that there aren't chances. Be like, you know what? We can't win a game. We can't win that game where it's fast, free-flowing, back and forth, you know, great chances at both ends of the ice. So we need to make sure this game is, um, you know, few whistles and we just, we play this style of hockey. Uh, the Islanders have done this for years where um, it, it's just, it's, it's lower scoring. There aren't as many scoring chances. It's free flowing. There's not as many penalties and it's just, it's the style of hockey that, that they've played. And it does feel like there's other teams that have started playing that as well. And that's kind of how that, that gets going. Now, in the event that a team in this year's playoffs in 2024 goes on a run. So let's just say that, that Washington or LA go on a bit of a run and they're playing that defensive style and they're shutting down teams that are, we, we look on paper and we say this team's far more offensively gifted. Well, now for other coaches, they might come into the following season and say, you know what? If we can really limit chances, we're good. Uh, San Jose, when they started playing better after those those two back-to-back -back games where they gave up 10 goals, San Jose started playing a style like that and it, it's worked for them. It's got them to 16 wins. Uh, which is not a lot of wins, but considering the lineup they have, I think that's respectable. Uh, and, and again, it's part of it is that they play this defensive style where there aren't very many chances. And so are we going to see an era, especially with how many teams are going through rebuilds and how many teams might have a little bit less creativity on their roster? Like, I'm not saying they aren't NHL-level players. It's just those really supremely talented players, some teams don't have that. And so you have to play the let's limit opportunities and so where i get kind of i mean I, I don't know how how the nhl will go about it is that so the nhl scoring right now is at 3.12 goals per game per team last year it was at 3.16 or 3.17 i believe so it's dropped a little bit not a lot it has not dropped a lot lately it's dropped off quite a bit but we're getting closer to playoffs so it's not outside of, of what's normal to see scoring drop as we get ready for the playoffs because teams understand defense wins championships. Uh, and it's something I've talked about before. And it's something I noticed as far back as the 80s where Montreal was already always really hard to beat because defensively they were so smart. They were so sound. And so when the Devils came through in 95 with Jacques Lemaire as the coach, there were those who said, hey, this started with Montreal. Montreal started this movement uh, and, and they did. And so we might be seeing the start of another movement. I don't think we'll see another dead puck era because I don't think the NHL would want that. It's not conducive to some of the highlight real goals. Again, 
every highlight reel goal we talk about and how much we like it, there's a coach somewhere that doesn't. So, yeah, we'll see how it all goes. But let me know your thoughts. I know there are people who really liked the clutch and grab kind of hockey. It's what we call it, clutch and grab. Because you could just grab the guy's jersey and no call. Like, nothing. You could hook the guy, and as long as you're not really, really hooking, you're okay. As long as you're not, like, pulling, fine. But you can get your stick around a guy. And that doesn't matter if you're slower than he is. You're going for a ride. So, and, and and he's not able to get his arms freed up, or he's not able to get comfortable, and so he's not able to score those goals. Uh, so I, I don't know. Like, I've heard people talk about maybe they could do, like, illegal defense, like in basketball. Good luck. Good luck is all I have to say about that. I, I don't think that's something they could do. But I do wonder, like, if we start seeing scoring going in the other direction, does the NHL change some rules again uh, in order to try to increase scoring and creativity? Because they love it. They do. Uh, they, they really, they know that people tune in to watch the hitting, the scoring, and the fighting. And so I don't think anything's been done to curb any of the three. The game's evolved, so there's less fighting. But the NHL's never really done anything to try to get fighting out of the game. Because I understand it's part of the game and it's part of the reason that, that people watch. It's not a reason I watch necessarily. I always put the fights on the board when they happen if I see them. But it's, it's not a reason for me to watch the game. It's just, it's a noteworthy event if somebody has a fight. And the fact that the NHL is a league that if you have a fight, you're out of the game for five minutes and then you're back on the ice. It's totally different than if a fight breaks out in the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball. So they do have that as a selling point. And, and it seems to do well selling that way. Although, again, the fighting is not what it used to be. But let me know your thoughts. So my only my only reason for this is because it, it does feel like the game could go one of two ways. Either we see the scoring stay up, right? Which allows us to have these conversations about McKinnon and Kucherov potentially putting up like 140 points and, you know, really high point totals. Uh, or are we going to see a drop-off? Are we going to see where we're getting back into a league where goal scoring isn't where it was? 2014-2015 isn't that long ago. And we saw a real drop in goal scoring around that era. And of course, the NHL made some changes there too, which I can talk about in another video as well. But I wanted to talk about this because this was where uh, the NHL was in a bit of a crisis with its goal scoring and its creativity. And they knew they needed to make some changes. So... Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Are you pro-neutral zone trap or anti? Let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And hey, again, I'm, I'm just, just saying that this is very often cyclical. We will probably see scoring drop off again. Because once once coaches figure out, okay, this is this is where the, the hole is with the defensive aspect of our game, uh, then we start seeing those goals dry up a little bit. We start seeing those, those opportunities. Uh, fall by the wayside and then what happens is then teams start coaching that offense to break through that defensive structure or in this case the NHL makes changes to try to make it so that you're, you're not able to necessarily limit the scoring chances as much as you did before so it's a it's a fascinating aspect of the game that I understand other sports go through this too baseball is always trying to balance it the difference you know the the pitching and the hitting uh and you know yeah we'll see uh, we'll see how things go. But let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I, I just thought this was topical because it does feel like there's a lot of teams right now playing the 1-3-1. One, one, and some are having success. So other teams are definitely going to take notice. Uh, thank you guys so much for all your support as always. I will talk to you again soon.